what I want to talk about tonight is the relationship between the natural world and human agriculture that interacts with it, because there are a lot of challenges and issues in that space. And as Jonathan mentioned, I've, I've worked with farmers all across the Palouse and in other parts of the country where we are working through a lot of those challenges. And the point that I want to get across tonight is, is similar to points that I've made in previous talks here, where um, in, within the context of understanding that the world that God created, it has a certain order to it. There's a, there's a creation, natural order to the way that the world operates and works. And in uh, analyzing things like politics and economics and different cultural issues, uh, we see that humans in rebellion against God are uh, trying to break through those boundaries, those limits that God has set in place through creation. Genesis 2.15 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the word here for tend means to cultivate, but it means to cultivate in the context or with a connotation of service, service unto the thing that you're cultivating. So in this context, God has, tells us to tend the earth, to tend creation. And so we're supposed to do that as an act of service. And so we're supposed to take care of it and keep it and protect it. And then in Genesis 1:26, then God said, let them have dominion. Mankind is supposed to have dominion over the earth. We're supposed to rule the earth. And so we have some different values here, okay? In Genesis 1, uh, we, have, we have dominion and we have rule. In Genesis 2, we're supposed to serve creation and take care of it and guard it. And obviously, all of these values shouldn't be pitted up against each other. Uh, ideally, I think that we're supposed to rule the earth, have dominion on the earth, and do it within the context of, not to be cliche, but sort of servant leadership. That's, that's I think, what is being communicated to us in Genesis. But if we do pit them up against each other and kind of take some extremes and, and build cartoon characters off of them that sort of resemble reality on the one hand, Team dominion, team rule is sort of like, you know, the guy that says, hey, there's silver in that mountain and we want silver and we need silver. So uh, too bad for the mountain. We're going to get rid of it and get what we want. It's this idea of we are in control of the earth. And um, if, if, if there's something that we want to do with the earth, God has given us permission to do it. On the other extreme... Okay, we have the people who worship Mother Nature, okay, who, who basically say uh, at the end of the day that humans do not really deserve to be here on the earth any longer. All we have done is one, caused one environmental disaster after another, and uh, it would just be flat out better if the human race wasn't on the earth any longer. Uh, okay, both, both viewpoints are, are, both perspectives are wrong, in my opinion. Although um, there are some valid points between them. In the upper left hand corner there, we have a, a picture of the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see uh, what we call the dead zone there. Okay, several thousand square miles where biology in the ocean simply cannot thrive any longer. Okay, why is there a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico? We know why. We've caused it, okay? A lot of farmers in the Midwest have caused this by allowing, uh, basically, their fertilizers have leached or run off their fields and gone down the Mississippi River and deposited into the ocean. It's a disaster, okay? We haven't been good gardeners in this respect. The upper right-hand uh, uh, picture is uh, or graphic is uh, not directly tied to, to agriculture, perhaps, but uh, we've we've turned the Pacific Ocean into a trash dump. Okay, I, I watched these YouTube videos with my kids where some guy is exploring some isolated island in the South Pacific, and it's you know beautiful coconut trees and uh, colorful birds and and fish, and then you see the beach just strewn with layers and layers of plastic bottles and trash. Okay. On the lower left, you have a picture of the Dust Bowl, the 1930s Dust Bowl. Okay, this uh, was a period in the, in the Plains states where um, severe drought uh, combined with the, uh, the fact that the farmers had, had their fields exposed. The soil of their fields was exposed and the winds picked up and carried all of that topsoil away and blew it away. It was a disaster, right? 
Hundreds of thousands of people were displaced. Economic and environmental consequences uh, were negative and they were large. In the lower right hand uh, picture, okay, we don't learn our lessons very well. This was recently, in recent years, taken in, in Eastern Washington. And I think every five to seven years, I'll have a farmer text me a, a picture of this and says, okay, we've got another haboob coming. I don't know the etymology of that word haboob, but that's what you call these big dust storms. And it's the same thing. The fields had the soil exposed and the winds came and blew the topsoil away. Dr. Dwayne Beck at South Dakota State University is a researcher who has kind of had a, a leading voice in uh, challenging uh, farmers and the agricultural industry to figure out how we can do better by the environment with our agricultural practices. And so he brings, um, you know, he kind of preaches with a secular voice to a secular world saying ecosystem degradation is a symptom of indifference, greed, jealousy, selfishness, ignorance, etc. Okay. And so he is identifying with many other people like him that at the root of environmental and ecosystem degradation, we have moral issues. Okay. Moral issues is what's at the heart of it. And, and we as Christians say, well, okay, if it's moral issues, it's really a spiritual issue issue okay we have rebelled against god we have not done well in tending and serving and guarding the earth we've known this for a long time that we degrade land so in the 30s bennett and louder milk right wrote history is largely a record of human struggle to wrest the land from nature because man relies for sustenance on the products of the soil so direct is the relationship between soil erosion, the productivity of the land, and the prosperity of people that the history of mankind, to a considerable degree at least, may be interpreted in terms of the soil and what has happened to it as the result of human use. And then from uh, David Montgomery, who is a, a geology professor at the University of Washington, wrote a, wrote a great book called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, where he actually digs into some historical examples of uh, what Loudermilk was uh, writing about. And he says, with rare exceptions, the fields of all countries have been made to bear their crops without the least reference to the interest of future generations. So he's, he's coming to the conclusion that We've degraded land over and over and over again throughout history, and we've done so because we've been very short-sighted. Our motives, our incentives have been in the short term as opposed to the long term. This is a picture of Natus, native uh, Palouse Prairie. This picture was taken uh, just north of Pullman, and um, on the Palouse, there is, there's less than 1% 1, 1 of the land area is still native Palouse Prairie. Um, I was walking through this field in, in June of one year and took this picture. You can see some, some uh, plants are flowering, but there's just a diversity of plants. There's gonna be more plants that end up blooming as, as the summer goes on. The farmer that owns the land was walking with me and said, it's, it's just wooly, and it is. It's like, a, it's like a jungle, and there's life everywhere. I mean, I have never heard insects be so loud as walking through this as compared to walking through a, a typical wheat field in the Palouse. There's a lot of life above ground, and you can feel it almost um, in your shoes, in your boots, below the ground. Um, we settled the Palouse in the late 19th century, and uh, by the 1910s, we had uh, plowed virtually every acre of land that could be plowed. And uh, what was too steep to bring into agriculture, we, we put livestock out there and grazed it and overgrazed it. Um, you can see this uh, pretty clearly. If you go for a hike uh, down into the, the breaks to the Clearwater River, so if you go down to Genesee and, and you hike down to Lewiston, let's say, um, you're going to just be um, trudging through a mat of star thistle. Okay? Thistle is just taking over the, the whole area. Um, and um, I work with uh, some farmers in the area who are trying to, to undo that damage to the ecosystem. Um, but it takes a lot longer to restore things than it does to damage them. And so what I want to do is uh, I want to take a few minutes to do like ecosystem processes 101 and examine what native ecosystems, how they operate compared to how ecosystems that are in intensive agriculture end up operating. And so three categories that we'll like look at water cycle, nutrient cycle, and 
the energy flow. So what, what is the water cycle? Well, what happens to rainfall when it hits this, this Palouse Prairie is it, it, it falls out of the sky, hits all of those plants, the plant residue, and it goes down and makes its way down to the soil and it infiltrates the soil pretty rapidly. But the main point that I wanna express is that when the rain falls on this ground that's, that's covered year round, it goes in the ground where it falls, okay? As opposed to modern conventional tillage-based agriculture where we work up the fields, we plow it, smooth it out, and you look out there and it's just brown, right? It's exposed soil, okay? Well, when it rains, the water goes in the soil to a certain extent, but not entirely. If you go out in the springtime, especially early spring, go for a drive out in the country, and you look up, especially on the hills in the Palouse, right? There's just these channels of water coming off of the fields. Um, it's like Willy Wonka's at the top of the hill with the spigot open, and it's just chocolate milk flowing down, okay? <laughs> That's not what is supposed to happen. Um, uh, it's ugly. So um, uh, geologists estimate that the Palouse has lost about 40% of its topsoil since we've started farming here. Okay, because it's not just water that we're losing. It's 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 looks like chocolate milk for a reason. It's it's taking soil with it, and it's not only taking soil, but all of the nutrients that are in the soil also go with it. Um, and so, when I'm talking about nutrients, I'm basically talking about fertilizer. Okay, chemicals within the soil that provide food for growing plants. The other thing is that um, there's a lot of carbon in this picture. Okay. Plants, you know, photosynthesis, they sequester, um, they, they breathe in CO2 and uh, their, their leaves, their stalks, their seeds are all made of carbon. Those fall on the ground after the plant dies and the soil biology gobbles them up, pulls carbon into the soil. And when that happens, um, it increases the water holding capacity of the soil. But when you till the, the soil, um, you release all that carbon back up into the atmosphere and the water holding supply uh, capacity of our agricultural fields is relatively low. Um, I mentioned that the fact that uh, we have the runoff, the soil erosion due to water and how that, um, how, how that also takes with it the nutrients in the soil. Uh, going back to what I showed earlier, the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico, that is directly due to fertilizers coming off of farms, running off of fields, leaching out of fields into the water supply. Um, other things though, if you go to Des Moines, Iowa, you're likely to meet a lot of taxpayers there who have sued the state government and um, are upset about the fact that they have to pay millions and millions of dollars to filter their drinking water because they gotta get the phosphorus and the nitrogen out of it, the fertilizers, okay? Um, and the lakes in the Midwest um, also, get all of this phosphorus off of the farms. It, it runs off and you get these big algae blooms that are unsafe for animals and for humans. With the nutrient cycle in an in a environment, in an ecosystem like this, the plants uh, through the roots bring up nutrients out of the soil. Um, there's uh, a diversity of soil biology that lives symbiotically with the plants. So bacteria, fungi, and other little critters in the soil bring these nutrients to the plants, the plants die, they decompose, and those nutrients go back into the, into the soil. And so you have this circular process happen. It's uh, nutrients are truly cycled. But if you, if you export the nutrients, you kill that biology and you degrade the land. So if you were to come to this Palouse Prairie and just mow it and, and, and bale it and send off your bales, you would, you would, just, you would kill this, this whole ecosystem overnight, okay? The soil biology then wouldn't have any food to eat and you would lose nutrients. You would export a lot of the nutrients that are in those plants. Um, wheat production in this region, uh, we're pr primarily a wheat producing region here. We export about 90% of the wheat that we produce here and it goes overseas. Okay, well, what's in those wheat kernels? Significant amounts of the nutrients that plants need to grow, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium. And so we send those out. How do we replace those nutrients? Well, farmers, um, they, they export the nutrients out and then they buy fertilizers and bring it back in. 
input it into the farm ground, and repeat the process. So it's not a cyclical process of replacing the nutrients. It's more of a linear extraction-based process. Um, soil itself is a finite resource. As I said, we've lost about 40% of our topsoil here. Um, we're fortunate that we have very deep soils on the Palouse. Okay, but it's, it's one of those sustainability issues. You can't just keep on losing your soil. It is astronomical, the amount of millions of tons of topsoil we've lost here, and this still continues to happen to this day. Now, we replace those nutrients, like I said, with fertilizers that are brought in in this linear process, but those synthetic uh, nitrogen fertilizers that we bring in, actually, while they help degraded land still produce food, it still degrades the soil over time. We're gonna spend a lot of time on energy. Uh, how, how, how does an ecosystem get energy? Well, we know that sunlight drives all biological processes, right? Uh, and these plants are aggressively competing for as much energy from the sun as they can get. Okay, those, all those leaves are basically solar panels and they're fighting for sunlight for energy and the soil biology and really all of the biology on the land depends upon the sequestration of energy from the sun. The sun gives us more energy in one day than the whole human race, you know, consumes in a year. And it's the sun probably gives us a lot more than that, actually. Maximizing solar energy encourages more life, more nutrients and healthier plants and land. So regenerative agriculture is the concept that we should look to the natural ecosystems that we farm within in order to learn how to sustainably manage water, nutrient, and energy cycles, instead of employing linear extraction-based farming techniques that ultimately end up degrading the land. So before the, pre, before the Industrial Revolution, when uh, people were uh, more mobile, right, they would settle in a region they'd, they'd farm, they weren't cycling their nutrients very well, they degraded the land, they couldn't produce food off of it anymore to sustain themselves, and they had a choice. It's either starve to death here or move on. So that was kind of the standard procedure, right? If you degrade the land, you move somewhere else. But then, um, you know, as, as we sort of concentrated more into cities, we became less mobile, right? Um, populations in cities can't just pick up and move. But what, how, how, so how were those, those cities, those civilizations fed? Well, they, there would be a city, and then around the city, there'd be a circle of agriculture where the food was produced for the people, and that land over time would get degraded, and so the circle would just keep on expanding larger and larger around the cities. So what was the solutions? Well, I mean, uh, conquest, okay? Empires would go out and, and, and seek out more resources from other uh, from other lands, and um, when you invade other people's territories, wars and things like that happen. So there's social costs to all of this. But the challenge even with that is that there are transportation and energy limits. So I'll illustrate it this way. Let's say you are a farmer and you've got a mule and you've got a sack of wheat that you wanna take into the town to sell the, the people there. And, uh, but there's only, you can only go so far before you and the mule use up more energy than what's in that sack of wheat, okay? So the transportation and energy limitations are big. But then the Industrial Revolution came along, okay? And that changed the game entirely in the 1800s, okay? It solved the transportation challenge, but it also drastically sped up the degradation of farmlands. So what happened in the Industrial Revolution? Well, we discovered coal. We didn't really discover coal. The Chinese had been using it for hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, the Romans in Britain used coal pretty extensively. Um, but um, after that, um, in Britain, coal use kind of died down for a while. I think I read once that in the 1300s, the artisans in London uh, realized how uh, energy efficient burning coal was as opposed to wood or, or other fuel sources. And so they're uh, uh, burning coal in their furnaces to make pottery or whatever. And um, the governing authorities at the time, whoever they were, I'm not a historian, uh, said, we got to put a damper on this because there was air pollution and people were getting sick. But um, 
But then uh, when uh, in the in the 1800s, we we developed the steam engine, which combined with other scientific and technological advances, we were able to start transporting coal all around the country and all around the world. And so industry really took off, right? Because you could you could uh, mine coal in one place, transport it very cost effectively to um, a factory somewhere else. As it regards agriculture, probably the biggest development in the Industrial Revolution was the, um, the development of the Haber-Bosch process of producing ammonia nitrogen fertilizer. So World War I time period, uh, Fritz uh, Haber and Karl Bosch, Germans, um, said, you know, there's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere. 75, 80% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. We have all of this degraded farmland. How can we get the nitrogen out of the air and put it into a form that plants can use in order to grow? They, they figured out how to do it. Um, and you can read all about it in this book, The Alchemy of Air. Highly recommend. It's a, it's a page burner if you want to understand the history of this and how it really impacted world war, the world wars. And um, um, it's, a, it's a fascinating read. So um, that became a solution to degrading soils. And, and we use the Haber-Bosch process of producing these fertilizers to this day, although that we, we don't use coal very much to do it. But it is highly energy intensive, okay? Because you have to take hydrogen molecules and nitrogen molecules, put them under a lot of pressure, has to be heated up to 400, 450 degrees Celsius. So it takes a lot of energy in the first place just to make the fertilizer. Okay, well, why is this important to agriculture and food production today? Because 80%, around 80% of the total input cost in agriculture can be traced directly to energy. And that energy comes from fossil fuels primarily, okay? Uh, the price paid to farmers in Idaho for a bushel of wheat in April of 1978 was $3.04. A barrel of oil was $8.82 at the same time, okay? Today, farmers can sell a bushel of wheat for $4.96 and a barrel of oil is $90.52, okay? So let those ratios sink in a little bit. Um, don't try to adjust for inflation because it's not going to matter too much. So with that, how can farms even stay in business? Well, the answer is the Haber-Bosch process for one. Okay, we were able to just pour more and more synthetic nitrogen. And as I said before, that still maintains yields even on degraded land. But the other factor is the genetics of the crops that we grow now. So in the uh, example of wheat, Right? There's wheat breeders at, at universities and private companies that are coming up with new varieties of wheat that just yield better and better and better, okay? much better than what it was in the 1970s. Um, in fact, um, a couple of years ago, Washington State University came out with a variety of wheat that is tolerant to low pH soils. Okay? So 6.5 pH is a, a soil pH is, is a good place to be for, for most crops because that's when nutrients in the soil become most available to the plants. Um, but when you pour on synthetic nitrogen over and over again, um, it acidifies the soil, okay? So Washington State comes out with this variety, it's low pH and tolerant. And this is a major problem on the plus, by the way, uh, lowering pHs. But this is like throwing a Band-Aid on a problem, not really getting to the heart of what, what, are, what are the problems with lowering pHs? No, we're not gonna deal with that. We're gonna keep on acidifying our soils, but we come up with temporary fixes, Band-Aids. So I wanna make this point in regard to energy because it affects not just agriculture, but really the totality of our lives as we know it. All forms of energy that depend on extracting or mining of finite resources, such as phosphorus and potassium, which are other fertilizers, and fossil fuels is not a long-term sustainable fuel source. Okay, now my friends in the fracking industry say, Jeremy, we have got a lot more natural gas to mine, okay? So, you know, you hear different reports one extreme says we've got 40 to 100 years left of fossil fuels. Other people say, no, don't, don't even worry about it. We, we have a long ways to go before we exhaust them. But I ask them, do those wells go dry? Yes, they do. Okay. 
So whether it's a hundred years or a thousand years or 10,000 years, okay, if they are finite, they're finite resources. Um, and they will run out someday. So going back to Dr. Montgomery's statement earlier, where we have been short-sighted in how we do agriculture and how we uh, serve God's creation, um, and we do it, we're just, we're thinking short-term. Well, we need to start thinking more long-term. And greener energy sources um, may be getting us closer in, in a better spot, but they still depend on finite resources. So go ahead and buy your Tesla, but it's just a matter of time before uh, we're tired of mining lithium and cobalt, um, or it runs out, okay? And this is, a, this is an issue for our region where there are proposed cobalt mines. I'll throw another economic um, factor into this. Between 2018 and 2022, the U.S. federal government subsidized agricultural producers with $123 billion in direct payments, okay? So we're being subsidized to keep on farming the same way that we're farming. Um, and on top of that, right, farmers buy crop insurance in case there's gonna be any failures, but the premium for the crop insurance is also subsidized by the federal government, okay? Um, and then you might ask, well, how much does the federal government spend on research to uh, figure out how to start farming more sustainably or more in more environmentally friendly ways? Okay, it's a, it's a small fraction compared to all of this. What I wanna say is that the last couple hundred years, we have been drunk on fossil fuels and we've been having a good time, okay? And we don't know how long that that will last. And it may affect, as I said, the totality of our lives as we know it. Paul Kingsnorth uh, is a writer and a uh, journalist, and uh, he calls himself a recovering envir environmentalist. He was in the extreme environmentalist movements um, in previous decades, and he became um, disenchanted with that. He saw that the envir environmental movements were not really providing any uh, serious solutions to the problems that we have. Uh, he's, he's a, he became a Christian a few years ago, and I highly recommend him as a, as a source to read on these topics. He says, the human impact on the world is now so enormous that the civilization we have built is feeling the shudders. If the world's governments, with the collusion of some environmentalists, want to pretend that the need to question the underlying values of that civilization can be staved off with wave machines and wind turbines, that is up to them. But we should understand that whether we choose to dig up coal and burn it or carpet the wildlands with barrages and turbines, we are making a statement. This is our world and we will exploit every inch of it. We want, no, we need more energy for our televisions, cars, and aeroplanes. It is our right, there is no alternative. Okay, basically what he's saying is similar to that character that I made earlier, where if we can do it, we should do it. Again, I think that this is at, um, at, at the heart of things, it is a spiritual problem. We think that modern life with all of its leisure and technology and entertainment, we've confused that with essential necessities for existence, okay? And so we gotta pre preserve life as we know it. And then when faced with the reality of the situation, with the reality of finite resources being consumed, we tend to put faith in the human intellect to figure it out, okay? Um, that, that's the most common thing that I hear in response to, to this talk is, don't worry, Jeremy, we're, we're, we're gonna get it figured out. We've got time. Okay, I hope so. But in the meantime, what we need to do is repent in the ways that we know that we've failed and start being good gardeners to the extent that we can, recognizing that this world is pretty messed up, okay? The systems and the economies in place uh, just highly disincentivize and prohibit us from doing a good job, the good job that we should do. But we trust in God, uh, which has been a common conclusion tonight, um, who is good at pushing the reset button when we start pushing the boundaries too far, okay? The limits of God's created order. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this presentation from the George Buchanan Forum Conference. We have many more that you can check out at our website at tgbf.com. 
www.freefreedomfoundation.org. You can also find us on YouTube or on your favorite podcasting platform. In true free market fashion, we're entirely crowdfunded by the generous support of people like you. If you'd like to help our work, you can set up one time or recurring donations at tgbf.org. The best way for others to hear about us is from their friends. So please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing our material. We greatly appreciate it.